This week, everybody, the start of our show is going to be a somber one as our thoughts and prayers are with the Moore family. We lost John Moore this week, the driver of the No Problem Ford Bronco back in the day. The giant killer is what he was called by a lot of his peers because he could go out there and he could beat Bigfoot and Gravedigger. He could beat some of the biggest names in the sport. Carolina Crusher, throw that name out there as well. Uh, John Moore was one of the good ones, folks, and uh, sad, it's very sad to see him go. So I want to take a moment of silence right here at the top of the show to say we're going to miss you, John. Thank you, everybody, for that moment of silence for John Moore. And again, our thoughts and prayers go out to the Moore family. This week on the show, you're not going to see Josh Rhodes on it. This is the most you're going to hear from me this week, folks. Tomorrow, I fly to Minneapolis and uh, get things set up for the Minneapolis Monster Jam. This week, we've got Jason Rona and Matt Stoltz hosting the show. And uh, they pulled out Salt Lake City 1990 from the archives to talk about. And i got to tell you, it sounds like it's going to be a good show. I personally haven't listened to it yet. I just got sent the audio, so we're going to go and roll with it and see how it goes here. I want to say real quick, thank you everybody for all the subscriptions and the comments and the likes over on YouTube as well as the five-star Apple iTunes reviews and, of course, the follows and downloads over on Spotify as well. You guys are killing it and you're making our podcast grow and grow and grow we, leaps and bounds every week. So thank you guys for doing that. Had a little bit of an issue this week with iTunes, but I believe it's been solved in episode 48 and 49 are finally up there for you. So go ahead and give them a chance, guys. Give them a listen. Until then, though, I will see you guys on the tracks across America. And let's go right into it. Jason Rona, Matt Stoltz, let's see what you guys got for us. Salt Lake City 1990 here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. Welcome everybody here to the Retro Monster Truck Review, and yes, indeed, I have finally overthrown Josh Rhodes as the primary host of this podcast. Um, well, no, that's that's not true. Uh, Josh is on the road with Monster Jam as a tech official for this first quarter, so I'm going to be filling in here each show as your temporary host with a variety of co-hosts each week until Josh is able to record again with me here on the podcast. So this week... We are talking Salt Lake City, 1990, with our friend Jason Rona from J Concepts. How we doing, Jason? Good. How we doing, Matt? I'm doing fantastic. And when I asked you to kind of come up with a show idea to do here on the podcast, I was not surprised to hear the Salt Lake was your pitch because, Jason, you're a big, big time Bigfoot fan. And this is one of the shows that really kind of tells some of the story of this 1990 TNT season, but we didn't get to see it on television. Yeah, I mean, it really once uh, Tomster stuff got this uh, got this up online on YouTube, um, it's, it actually kind of filled in a few blanks, I think, for all of us, and we started to realize what a lot of the complaining was all about in uh, Albuquerque, I guess, and how things got a little um, boisterous. And I think some of the results that we're going to see here in this show is uh, is is kind of what preceded that it is indeed we're here on february 23rd 24th and 25th of 1990 as jason mentioned we're watching a youtube compilation here from username tomster stuff and that's tommy lewis so we want to thank tommy for putting these videos up on youtube a few years ago for us to all watch and kind of fill in these areas from the west coast that we didn't get to see on tv so much so we're in the salt palace again february 1990 this building opened in 1969 uh, initially it had no major tenant construction was kind of pushed as a bid to host the 1972 winter olympics Unfortunately, Salt Lake City didn't win the bid, and they wouldn't host the Winter Olympics for another 30 years long after the Salt Palace was gone. So bummer for that, but they got a nice building they were able to have a ton of good events in. A uh, year after it opened, it became home to the American ba Basketball Association's Utah Stars from 1970 to 75, and 
the Salt Lake Golden Eagles minor league hockey team. So they did end up getting some sports tenants. And then after the ABA NBA merger, uh, Jason, you probably know more about that than I do because you're a basketball guy. The Utah Jazz take residence up in the building in 1979. They came from New Orleans, and that was their home until 1991 when the Delta Center was built, and that's the building that still stands today. The Salt Palace demolished in 1994, but it would be the major home for monster trucks in Utah throughout these 80s and early 90s. USA Motorsports, this TNT show, they did TNT polls and monster trucks in the building. USHRA and a lot of other independent promoters I found as well had events featuring monster trucks and got to be the big star from the Utah Jazz, Carl Malone. I know he's not quite on the upper echelon as your uh, your man Michael Jordan over there, though. Well, you know, Carl Malone was um, – he was the man uh, back in those days. Uh, you know, of, of all the, the superstars that were in the NBA, he was one of the top probably five guys um, in that 80s, 90s generation. You know, there was the, the Jordans, the Charles Barkleys, the, you know, Patrick Ewings and, um, you know, a host of other – uh, guys that were in that late 80s, early 90s, and he was one of them. And um, they got John Stockton, which you know became the Stockton Stockton to Malone was a big uh, uh, a big move for them that they uh, would call some of their plays. So um, they actually had uh, they had a great team and a great coach there in Utah, Jerry Sloan. Yeah, so maybe I mistook their uh, saying. Not the upper echelon. He he was a top player, Jordan, of course, in his own league. But I'm I'm a David Robinson guy myself, so I wasn't uh, super big into what was happening there out on the full West Coast when I was a kid. I was a little young for some of that yet. So it's good to see uh, the history and Carl Malone, of course, getting involved with monster trucks about another 10, 12 years later with the power forward truck. Yeah, we really got um, <clears throat> a real mixture of monster trucks and. Um, basketball players and, um, you know, man, there was a real big uh, mix-up going on there. And then you, you enter, you know, you get wrestling in, involved. And uh, we had sort of this uh, three-way, uh, three-headed monster of uh, different types of sports that we're all trying to kind of use each other, I guess, uh, to, to help promote their, their individual uh, sports. Yeah, the cross promotion was a big thing heading here into the 90s. You mentioned the wrestling connection as well and into the 2000s. So, you know, this is kind of all one big arena, and and we're focusing on the TNT Monster Truck Challenge here a little bit before that time. We've got a killer lineup of trucks. This is kind of a small arena, you know, your hill and cars TNT type of indoor show, but a huge, huge field. We've got Awesome Kong with Steve Kane, Barely Tame with Kevin Hoppe. Tough Enough with Pablo Cruz. Troublemaker with Mike Peterson. I know Paul Marsing's killing to watch this show for that one. We got Rocky Mountain Thunder with Nick Jackson, the former nightlife number one truck. Master of Disaster with Doug Spanier. We've got Whiskey Business with Ken Deppy. Nightlife number two with Dave Nakwysork. No problem. And Big John Moore is in the house. Mad Dog and Bob Breen. King Crunch with Scott Stevens. Marvin Smith's in Wild Hair. We've got John Valdez in the Rocky Mountain High, which is kind of a local regional truck. And that's, I believe, who Tommy was traveling with recording these shows. And then we've got our two kind of top superstar trucks, Steve Wilkie in USA One and Andy Brass in the new Bigfoot Number 8. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at this lineup and, <clears throat> you know, I had wrote some notes here um, along with, you know, I know you you – do a ton of notes as well but you know the only people really missing here equalizer uh carolina crusher um and you know but but this is a stacked tnt lineup this is like to me you know if i could go back in time you know you're you're just like you know what is it uh (laughs) take my money right for your tickets right that's right we've we've got probably I would assume a split weekend of TNT shows here, and I don't have the whole schedule in front of me. So you've got probably Equalizer and Carolina Crusher and Gravedigger probably headlining another show, maybe somewhere on the East Coast. And then you've got your Bigfoot and USA One headed out west to do battle with a lot of the other TNT stars, as well as some of the more regional names like Rocky Mountain Thunder, Rocky Mountain High, and Troublemaker. 
Yeah, I mean, I you know when I was watching this and kind of going over it, uh, I got a little confused on the Rocky Mountain trucks. Um, you know, I'm like looking at the names and I'm like, you know, Rocky Mountain Thunder. Um, you know, then I'm like getting confused because then, you know, there's all kinds of songs, Rocky Mountain this, and, <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, man, I, I'm, I don't know if I have these squared away. I just hope they're not selling Rocky Mountain eating oysters at the uh, concession stand at the Salt Palace. That wouldn't be a fun deal. Yeah, you know, I think that would be, uh, you know, something that you're not really looking forward to <laughs> with your popcorn. Yeah, we've got 15 trucks here in this small arena. That's going to shape up for some crazy action. And we're going to start off show number one here on the YouTube video with Tommy Lewis's Claud Buster, the little Rocky Mountain mini truck doing some scale car crushing um, and some attempted full-size car crushing during the pre-show. And Scott Douglas welcomes everyone to the arena over the event audio here the loudspeakers and we go into then driver introductions and the drivers are running out into the spotlight they introduce them one at a time kind of flanked by our friend go go the gorilla in some cases but um i, I like the cool pre-show little bit of footage that tommy puts in here and you know we're both rc guys getting to see the clod buster especially early on in its life that had to be something new for the live crowd yeah, I mean, we're talking about only a few years after the Claude Buster was released, and you could see how it was already tying in uh, to the real monster truck world. Um, I know this was the same year that I brought my Claude Buster to see uh, for Bob Chandler to see at the uh, the Bigfoot Bash uh, with my uh, my cantilever suspension. Uh, but um, you know that that was. You could see the tie-in, and I mean, I wrote the exact same thing down about the Claude Buster. You know, being an RC guy, you cannot like watch this, and you're just like, I can't deny the uh, the Claude Buster crushing cars here. And um, there's some other one where they got uh, some like uh, soda cans that he's using as like the crush cars, right? Yeah, I've seen that used by a lot of people, and it's something that works pretty well. I mean, if you're if you've got the cans laying around the house, you kind of organize them up into a little frame and you can kind of crush them like real cars. You know, and like you said, uh, the driver intros, uh, obviously kind of neat. You know, I never did. I'm trying to think if I did an actual TNT show or not um, back then. I have to remember. Uh, I think I did a couple uh, pulling events that had monster truck crushes, but I don't know that I ever did a uh, like a Renegades TNT Monster Truck Challenge, but it's kind of neat how they announced the drivers here, and they all have a little bit of personality uh, with Gogo the Gorilla. They're all, like you said, they're kind of messing around with uh, with Gogo, and he's kind of going back and forth. And then Scott Douglas really kind of doing a good job of just running the show himself there. For sure, the live event announcer not only just calling the action for the people in the stands but he's also somewhat the showrunner at this point you know you i'm sure they've got an event manager somewhere probably talking to him as much as they can on the sidelines but scott's kind of directing traffic out there on the floor especially for introductions and with all the cool production we have now with the trucks flying out and doing laps around the arena there's still something to be said for kind of the old school let the drivers kind of wave to the crowd and then we go into the anthem yeah and i think um, probably what it did, and especially in these days, is when all the trucks were, uh, you know, I'd say the majority of all these trucks individually owned uh, to some extent, that it shows the owner and the driver, or the owner and the truck at the same time. So you're making that, not only are you making that connection of the name of the truck, but the, actually the person that's behind it, um, which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah, it kind of helps build the personality behind the machine a little bit, which I think TNT did a good job with transitioning into the Tough Track show where they really built those storylines. So we're going to head into qualifying here. Our first matchup that we're qualifying them two at a time, we've got King Crunch and Master of Disaster. And this is our standard TNT indoor track. We've got the Mound of Dirt with an eight-car jump, and the finish line is after that seventh car. And a little bit of a longer shutdown area than some of the other arenas on this first quarter tour so they've got a little bit of room to shut down compared to like um roanoke where it was always really really tight in there they shortened up the car stack here in salt lake city and king crunch and master disaster the first ones to tackle the track and we see in this first run it's going to be kind of a rough track because tnt switched to a table top, tabletop style first hill 
kind of midway through 89 and try to slow the trucks down so the drivers couldn't just float over that and get onto the ground faster. We see King Crunch make kind of a half decent pass, but Master Disaster just pulled too hard over the hill, bounces hard into the cars, and then kind of has to drive across the top. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the first thing um, <clears throat> that I noticed right away was it it wasn't a smooth uh, acceleration over that first hump. Master Disaster we talked about has a lot of power in that truck, and uh, just him getting his timing right, it seemed like was a little difficult on that hill, uh, whether he's going too easy, too hard. Um, you know, Scott Stevens obviously had maybe has done more of these TNT type courses than Doug had and um, did a little better job. You can still see everyone's kind of feeling it out, though, and I'm sure that dirt is kind of crisp, you know, on that mound, so it's not round. It's like you said, if it's got a flat top on it, you got uh, kind of two bumps then to uh, navigate over before you hit that set of cars. And um, it's like Doug is a little all over the place, but the thing has a bunch of power and he loves bracing that landing with that left arm I noticed all the time. Maybe took some notes from Jim Cramer and Dave Weissorik on that one because you've got to stabilize yourself in that cab whenever you can. Next up, we're going to kind of join the next run in progress with No Problem and Troublemaker. No Problems must have gotten over that first hump pretty good because he's got a good lead, gets over the cars pretty quickly, and Troublemaker in a little bit of trouble in that other lane, kind of lands hard on the nose a couple truck lengths behind. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you can see like his truck very uh, kind of rough and rigid uh, in hard to do that. The roller, like you said, we missed a little bit of it, but um, – just not really doing the greatest job getting over that that roller and then getting off to the side and uh, just really kind of going through a learning experience there on that course. And then it looked like John Moore really put in a great run with no problem. This is when we really start to see John Moore start to elevate his performance. And I think by now we've already got the the fabled former Bigfoot engine in the truck in the no problem Bronco because the truck sounds really, really good. And like you said, John puts in a pretty good time here. We're going to head to the next qualifying matchup with Rocky Mountain Thunder and Mad Dog. And again, we're going to kind of join this one mid-run in the camera shot. These two, pretty even. It looks like Bob Breen maybe just had a slightly faster time overall. But I got to give Nick Jackson credit for not being a TNT regular. He punched in a pretty good run in the Rocky Mountain Thunder. Yeah, he did, and you can see he got up over the roller pretty nice, or he must have, and, and got a nice shot over the cars, and um, I'm not sure what who beats who here. I'm sure Mad Dog's still a little bit ahead, but um, at this point, Mad Dog's aging a little bit, and um, not a lot of improvements going on with that truck, I don't think, and you can see where he kind of, uh, the performance of that truck kind of lies now uh, with everybody else on the tour. You make a good point there because when we get into 87 and kind of through the midway of 88, Mad Dog is a top runner and is really competitive and winning races. And even into 1989 a little bit, we saw the truck take a win in Long Island at the Nassau Coliseum with the full fleet of TNT superstars. But here, another full year later, you see that the competition really has caught up with them. Speaking of this competition, one of the newer trucks on the tour – that primarily stuck on the West Coast, but came out East every now and then. Pablo Cruz is tough enough, is in the next run with Rocky Mountain High. And Pablo Cruz here makes a really good, smooth run. Maybe a little bit of a slow start, but a good run in that left lane. And then you can see in the other lane, Rocky Mountain High, just not really built for racing. He gives it his best effort. But as the local boy going in and trying to run with the big guys, you see that maybe the truck is more of a show truck rather than a dedicated race truck. Yeah, you know, and he could be protecting the truck a little bit too, uh, and not a lot of experience doing a, a course like this and racing uh, on this level, but it's a nice looking truck, you know, looking at this video, and he makes a nice um, pass across the cars once he gets up top, but but Pablo, man, he really put in a great run, uh, nice and straight, like you mentioned, off of the roller, and probably our furthest jump him and no problem maybe uh, so far uh, getting down those cars. Yeah, tough enough, pretty much landing right on the finish line. And Rocky Mountain High, you got to 
make it to the next round in order to get that next round money. So like you said, maybe he's saving the equipment a little bit. I like the roll bar setup on the Rocky Mountain High truck myself. Kind of something similar but a little bit different to what everybody else has out there. The next matchup is going to feature, though, two of the TNT regulars. we got USA 1 and Wild Hair. And Wild Hair, we see kind of launches to the left a little bit when he leaves, and that kind of makes him struggle throughout the track because he has to get lined back up for the cars. And the other lane, USA 1 is looking pretty fast. Even though he's missing the front clip, uh, Steve Wilkie rolled that truck over the previous week in Roanoke, Virginia. We saw it on tough tracks, and they got the truck back together enough to run and go on this West Coast swing here for Salt Lake City, and the truck doesn't really look bad performance-wise. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of, you know, I, I kind of went back and forth watching this one a little bit because it was interesting. Um, Steve's kind of launch off the line here. Uh, truck has a lot of power, as you mentioned. He gets over that roller. Um, you know, he puts a lot into it, gets a lot over that roller, then pulls that little wheelie, and then uh, kind of kind of runs out of talent <laughs> you know, before the set of cars there, trying to figure out what he's going to do, whether he's going to um, shift or go for it or – um, a lot of people kind of do that. Um, you know, that's kind of our RC racing term, run out of talent. It's not uh, – but that's just a, um, you know, a situation where these guys are just trying to get used to this track. And, you know, you want to get off the line, I guess. And But at the same time, you don't know how that thing's going to land coming off of that roller. And uh, we only got a couple guys so far kind of daring that roller a little more. And, you know, Steve here uh, doing it. And uh, Doug Spanier, he really went for it. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting watching how Steve does it with the kind of the wrecked USA one. So um, I was, I was kind of wondering while we were doing this, uh, if he – did he just go straight from Roanoke here or did they go back home first or what did they do? I'd imagine they may have swung into the shop maybe to just grab some parts or something. They certainly didn't have time to rebody the truck. That was a multi-week process back then because we're dealing with a steel body. And the truck performance-wise looks okay, but you've got to wonder if Steve Wilkie's got into his own head a little bit, not wanting to push it too hard too early after the crash the previous weekend. The next round, or next pair, I should say, that we have coming up here, Awesome Kong. And barely tame and awesome Kong, the skinny body Chevrolet, always looking good on the TNT tour. They've got the big engine in here for 1990. And what really surprises me is not necessarily awesome Kong, but how well barely tame runs here for sitting so low. The truck really pours on a bunch of steam in the second half of the track. Yeah, it's um, a little un, a little you know, unpredictable uh, how these qualifying pairings were going here, but barely tame just, you know, he, he kind of got over that, that mound really nice and it stuck to the cars and uh, just stayed on the power and actually put in a really good run. I mean, it doesn't look like a very high powered truck or a very, uh, you know, suspension oriented kind of truck. It's just kind of an old schooler, um, you know, with probably things they've learned along the line and, testing with that master disaster which kind of looks like their um kind of their pet truck the one that they put all the money or the time into mm -hmm. and this was just kind of like their 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 b or their second truck and i was able to find some information on on kevin hoppy uh for some of the other folks that have contributed to the podcast here nick davis gave me some information i believe it was where he was kind of a, a family friend that kind of joined on the road for a short period of time and i'll tell you what in the short amount of time he's driving the truck here, it looks like he's doing pretty well because I've never seen that original barely tame run any better than it does here. No, it looks it looks really good, and you know, kind of bouncing back over to Awesome Kong. Um, you know the, uh, you know you you think of those memes um, that are sometimes on social media, and it's like, you know, tell me it's you know 1989 or 90 without saying a word, and you put a picture of that skinny Awesome Kong, and it just. <laughs> You know, to me, that's that's really what that truck, uh, it just says to me every single time. Like, it's just, it's time stamped. Uh, I, I, I love the truck, too. Um, I, I think it was a really neat truck on their on their part. And I, I, I like to see it run well. Um, I was really confused about a lot of the driver changes and all that. But uh, overall, it still seemed like no matter who drove it, they always did pretty well. 
they always did well. They got the good visibility, and they had the power behind them for 1990 as well. So good to see the awesome Kong truck running well. Now this next pair, we've got Whiskey Business and Andy Brass and Bigfoot 8. And as we look at this run, we see that Bigfoot gets over the hill quick, obviously has the fastest run of all the trucks here, but the truck hangs a hard left between the hill and the cars. And even though Brass kind of basically clears all eight cars, he lands hard on that left front tire, pushes it up into the fender, kind of doing its best Bigfoot 7 impression, the way I look at it. Absolutely. And, um, Brass gets the truck shut down right in front of our camera view, and he's kind of concerned about maybe some potential breakage, and then he, he backs up. But um, Whiskey Business has a, an okay run in the other lane, and something that I didn't realize until you pointed it out, Brass, it appears, got DQ'd on this run. Yeah, I mean, I watched this this um, you know show one several times, and I was trying to figure out what was going on here because, you know, as we'll bring up later, there's another run that's a single, and it, not a lot makes sense at first when you go through it. You just think, oh, he must be fast qualifier. He got a buy run, and uh, but some things didn't quite add up when I was kind of watching this over and over again. And like you said, I think he got DQ'd on this for uh, not touching or not getting a, a, the right amount of tires uh, when he landed. And um, yeah, like you said, it's probably definitely the fastest run of qualifying, but um, they wanted him to stay a little more inbounds, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's a ball and a strike call, especially with the truck in the air like that. I mean, he hits the, f the first car with both front tires, but I'm guessing they call him on the keeping both side tires over the cars the whole way. I mean, he, he I think he does, but they must have called it that he didn't at that time. And or if there was an out of bounds line somewhere that we never really heard about on TV, maybe he you know went beyond that. And the bottom line is Brass has to come back, run again with a time penalty. And I think the time penalty in TNT was three seconds added to your time. Yeah, and this on a track like this where you're only doing three or four seconds, that's a big percentage. And, um, you know, compared to like later in the year where they do that three seconds added to your run, and it's um, not as big of a deal, I guess. You, if there's some slow trucks, you may be able to get up there into the field. But, um, yeah, like you said, he, he pulls his Bigfoot 7 uh, impersonation here, impression of uh, hitting the, uh, the fender with the left front tire. Uh, he talks to the Tomster here <laughs> and uh, about uh, what's going on with the truck. And um, Tomster communicates to him, I guess, that uh, the truck seemed okay. It was just the body. So Andy's like, kind of funny that Andy's kind of talking to him here. Like, he must have had a camera set up that he was doing this with. And then he was on a tripod or something, and then he was able to walk away from the tripod. I don't know. I guess. I mean, it would also indicate why this camera shot is so nice and steady throughout these shows because um, maybe having a solid mount there, it allowed him to just kind of pan and do what he needed to do. So the last qualifier we have here is Dave Wysorek in Nightlife. Not much to write home about here. He kind of just puts in a normal Dave Wysorek smooth run. He's going to put himself into the field and – the next thing we see is Brass coming in for his makeup run. Yeah, you know, Nightlife, um, you know, I, I would like to see him uh, drive, a, a, you know, perhaps down the road a, a little different truck or a stage two, stage two and a half, stage three truck to see how he could do. I was really a, seemed like a smart driver, took care of his stuff. But, um, you know, the truck here at this point, maybe a little bit, kind of outdated to to compete but still better than some of the others now uh, maybe we can do our campaign for dave wysork to be a tnt unfinished business to drive one of the new trucks perhaps yeah i mean he was at the hall of fame this year and it looked like he was kind of you know to me having an absolute blast being around all of his old uh monster truck buddies again i i couldn't help but notice that it just looked like he was kind of in his in his element. Oh, for sure. And still in it with the Reptar and Galactron, 
robots as well. So he's kind of always still been on the periphery of the industry to a degree. Mm -hmm. And it's good that he got to kind of hook up with a lot of his old buddies, though, there at the Hall of Fame this year. So, um, again, smooth run for Nightlife. And now we see Bigfoot come back for his makeup run again in this left lane. And we see Brass take it a little bit easier over the hill this time, making sure he gets a good straight approach on the cars. And he only catches the roof of that last car with the tires. Still a very, very good run. Uh, maybe still would have been fast enough to be number one without the time penalty. But, you know, I'm saying that it's probably going to put Brass toward the bottom of the lineup overall in this field of 15 trucks on the TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Yeah, you know, and I thought he did a good run, um, you know, on this on this hit. We'll get a little stopwatch action as we talk here, see what I can do. Um, you know, about three three point nine four seconds is what I got uh, on that pass, and but you add uh, three seconds to that, it's not going to be too hot, right? Yeah, he may have out qualified maybe one or two other people with that time penalty added in. Some of the folks that had a really bad run, but overall, it looks like Brass is going to have to try to come through the bottom half of the bracket with no lane choice, and we head into round number one. Our top qualifier ends up being King Crunch with Scott Stevens, and he's going to get the bye. He takes it very, very easy, as they often did in TNT competition, just kind of roll over the cars and head to that next round. And Because you've got lane choice the whole night, by virtue of being the fast qualifier, they weren't doing it based on ET, so save the equipment, get to that next round. Yeah, I noticed that with Scott quite a bit. He was probably, to me, the the most conservative when it came to having sort of a, a buy run or an easy run, he made sure to get through it. He didn't, you know, do the Dennis Anderson uh, t-shirt run. He didn't, you know, uh, kind of go out there and brag, you know, some of the, the fast guys, right? Like if you're a Bigfoot eight in this era or you're a, um, you know, USA one back in the day, sometimes they would run a full throttle uh, regular race pass. Um, in, in something that was almost a give me, which seems kind of strange that you would do that. But I guess at the same time, if you're going to win, you, you kind of have to know how your stuff's working. You have to use it as a real run. Well, for sure, yeah. I mean, we'll see how that plays out through the rest of this weekend here because each show we do here in Salt Lake City, one of these drivers is going to get a buy run as being fast qualifier. So this show, number one, it's Scott Stevens, and we head into our first head-to-head -head matchup of round number one. We've got Barely Tame and Troublemaker, and starting over the hill, these two are kind of even. And Troublemaker's run is an improvement from qualifying, but the truck still gets to bounce in pretty good between the obstacles and Barely Tame – Man, it's just looking good in that far lane, and he takes a truck length victory. Yeah, he's just making it look easy over there. Uh, he's got a truck. He's probably just um, running that thing. It's probably not even a blower motor in that truck. I don't know. It's he's just. It's almost like he's just full throttle in it, and he's just like, this is how it works. It goes through, and uh, makes it consistent for him. And the uh, the troublemaker kind of running into trouble uh, doesn't quite handle like the RC counterpart. I've seen a couple times out there. No, it, it works okay, but uh, hoping to get us some more wins for the Troublemaker truck this season. That's one of my vehicles out there in the RC Monster Truck world, so I try to maybe get some revenge on the competition compared to this performance here in Salt Lake City. Looks like Troublemaker's going to be out in round number one. Our next matchup, we've got Tough Enough and Rocky Mountain High, and Boy, based on this qualifying run and, and round number one, it looks like Pablo Cruz may be the breakout star of the night. He's getting over that hill just as smooth as anybody. Yeah, he, he seems to be very aggressive. The truck looks like it has a lot of power. Um, his visibility um, in that truck it always surprises me where he's sitting. I feel like his helmet is like even with the top of the cab yeah. um, in that truck. Like you can see it like bouncing through the sunroof. Uh, you know, in these runs, and I'm concerned for him if they if uh, he had a crash that that helmet's going to be uh, almost even with the top of the the cab there. You ain't kidding. He's got all kind of space around him on the sides, but the top a little bit tight on space. Maybe that's why he cut the sunroof out of that one, so he didn't have to hold his head against the ceiling. And um, in the other lane, though, Rocky Mountain High, he, he puts in a significantly better run than his qualifying pass, I'd say. The difference, I think, is without the planetaries, he just has trouble getting enough torque to get up over that hill quickly. Yeah, and now that you point that out, yeah, it's uh, he 
Um, the guy that I used to race with, he you gag it off the th- you know the throttle. You gag it. You get over that uh, that roller, and it it really lurches. Uh, or it has a hard time uh, torquing up over that hill. And but then he gets on the cars and and um, kind of does an old school like you keep it low, the old Mad Dog type run where you keep it low and you just you know haul across the mm-hmm. top of the cars and uh like you said finish it off pretty nice he did he had a lot of speed coming across the line we head into our mac our next matchup and we've got another rocky mountain truck this time rocky mountain thunder going up against the usa one and wilkie gets the jump over the line we see the difference here another truck with no planetaries but the big 572 in usa one's got the torque to get up over that hill just fine and the thing here with Wilkie, though, he, it looks like he's trying to do that front-end bounce into the cars that was so common in TNT. But we've got a little more space here between the obstacles, and the truck just doesn't bounce the way Wilkie's looking for. It kind of slips up, and that allows Rocky Mountain Thunder to really kind of stay in this race. If Wilkie had made a mistake, you know, there's only a truck length difference here at the line. Yeah, I think one thing that I was kind of pointing out was um, – um, the truck is in really good it seems like it's in good working condition like you know we mentioned earlier like it sounds like the you know it's got good power he's getting over that hill he's almost wheeling over it trying to do like that little mini slap wheelie where you catch the rear on the front set of the the cars and kind of uh, endo or over the whole thing but like you said the spacing is a little weird there for him between the mound and the cars and just having a lot of inconsistency i think like every one of his runs to me uh, looks different so far. Nothing looks the same. It's just kind of he's having a hard tr- time adjusting to this track. Yeah, he's trying to get the driving side of it dialed in and trying to maybe find some consistency behind the wheel, especially with the ups and downs they've had for these first two months in 1990. They had all kinds of issues in Charleston and then you know s- some good luck in uh, St. Paul and then back to more problems in Memphis and more problems in Roanoke. So uh, Wilkie's got to be tired by this point of the season, just trying to get the truck down the truck and track in one piece. And so far he's getting it done, albeit maybe not the exact way that he wants to. Yeah, exactly. I think this, um, I mean, it had to be, it had been really interesting to be on the inside of that, uh, that team during this time period where they had to work on this truck so much and they only had one vehicle. They kind of stalled, Um, working completion on the other truck and they were just really you know beating the daylights out of this uh, out of this particular truck and um, trying to put a body on it uh, in between shows like you said maybe took two weeks to do it and they didn't have that kind of time and um, and then you're still at that point you got sponsors you're trying to promote and uh, trying to act like a winner uh, or be a winner uh, because that's important to your branding and um Difficult, very difficult in these days for for this team. It really is. They were kind of behind the eight ball, so to speak. Our next matchup, we've got Awesome Kong and Wild Hair. The two kind of leave together, but we see the difference in horsepower between the obstacles. And the Jerry Janky engine and Awesome Kong just takes off. And we end up with a, a kind of a big margin of victory here just based on horsepower alone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned about the engine here. Um, you know, maybe you have some more information on what they kind of improved on or went to on the engine side of things. I'm not sure exactly what they ran before this, um, but uh, yeah, it looks like they got their their power sorted out. And, you know, I just couldn't help but note that I just felt like Wild Hair was really slow on this track. Like for a guy that's run so many of these and um, should have this track down, just the truck just didn't have much. Yeah, I mean, I think Marvin's running injection by this point, so maybe he was struggling with the altitude. Uh, Salt Lake City is pretty high up in altitude, I think, from from what I can recall. I know the Supercross guys um, have uh, some trouble with their conditioning and stuff when they go to run the Salt Lake Supercross outside. So maybe Marvin just doesn't have the fuel system quite right. Usually the the Wild Hair truck would get that little bit of top end power at least mid track and we just don't see the truck lurch off of the obstacles like we do in awesome kong so it may just be a matter of tuning the difference between these two vehicles Mm -hmm. so we're going to go to the next one 
our next matchup in round number one. There's so many of them here with a 15 truck field, and we've got Bigfoot and Whiskey Business, kind of a rematch from qualifying, but this time it's going to count. And Deffy, excuse me, Ken Deppy puts in his best effort, uh, but there's just no matching the Bigfoot eight so far in this competition. Brass skies the truck over the majority of the stack of cars again, gets about a full truck length victory and. It's, it's got to be kind of like the writing on the wall where if Bigfoot doesn't make a mistake, everybody might be in trouble on this night. Yeah, the, tr the truck uh, handles these courses extremely well. This is where, you know, sort of all the, the controversy started with this type of indoor course. The roller, um, which really kind of lended itself to could you power over this and land between the uh, mound and the car, stay on it, and then jump the cars, which is what this truck was good at was attacking that mound and doing the, the car set. And I think, I don't I think to me, I'll kind of feel like Andy was still taking it a little easier here. Um, you know, it doesn't look like he's coming out as hard as he probably could have, but trying to do what's necessary to win. But I'm sure there's also a lot of heat on them and in the pits about this truck being too quick for the competition. Um, but he makes a really good pass here out of the right lane, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, Wild Hair, or I'm sorry, Whiskey Business, actually does a really good run here, uh, kind of gives him all that he um, that the truck could do, and uh, makes a nice jump over the set of cars. I was pretty impressed, and then kind of gives us uh, usually a smoky finish with that truck. Yeah, that thing seemed to always be overheating or spewing some kind of fluid out of it at the end. And you mentioned the kind of grumblings about Bigfoot. Part of it is also, I'm sure these guys are recognizing that Brass isn't even going full throttle at this point and kind of saying, boy, if he's not even giving it all he's got, what's it going to mean when he does turn the power on? So we'll keep an eye on that throughout the rest of this bracket and see if Brass kind of turns the wick up on Bigfoot 8 at all. Nightlife versus Master of Disaster, our next matchup, and we see that Spanier still doesn't have that hill figured out. He gets all <laughs> kinds of up in the air, and, and it seems like Nightlife is kind of over the cars before Master of Disaster even gets going, but once Spanier gets the truck on the ground, he pours the coals to the Chevrolet in No Man's <laughs> Land, and it gives us probably the biggest non-Bigfoot jump so far of the night, and when the truck rebounds, this is something we kind of talked about before we recorded the show. It Spanier gooses the throttle on the rebound, and kind of like an RC truck or a Supercross bike, you actually see the truck level out and drop the tail because he's got so much wheel spin just from that little blip of the throttle. Yeah, I mean, this truck is very powerful, and it's that's what's great about going back and watching these things and doing podcasts like this is – uh, when you and I were talking about this truck during the, um, uh, you know, the the pre-show, is uh, that this this thing was just seemed like have so much power. Uh, you know, I watched another show from it um, from the year before, um, and then later on we get to Dallas where where it works so well, and um, and it was nice to see him put on a nice jump for the crowd there, and I'm sure being there in person, it had to be really impressive. The thing sounds awfully loud too. Yeah, it's uh, he's he's definitely got that thing tuned to kill, and uh, then you got nightlife over in the other lane. Just you know, I, I got written down that he's just a good driver, doesn't really take a lot of chances, and he kind of just gets the most that he can get out of his truck, and doesn't really make it try to make it do something that it can't do, and he goes as far as that'll let him advance. I agree. Why Sorek definitely one of the most consistent runners on the TNT tour, and you could almost guarantee that he's going to qualify in the top half of the field somewhere and then come back and more often than not get at least a round one win just by going out and running consistent. And Dave, I'm sure, made a lot of good money with the truck with that strategy. A lot of times he'd make it into the semis, even into the finals. So if the cards fell the right way, Dave was always right there in the mix. So good to see Nightlife going on to round number two. And our final race here of round number one going to be Mad Dog versus No Problem. Two very unique trucks on the tour. And I have written on my notes here again. You can kind of tell that 
no problem has that former Bigfoot engine in it because it straight out powers Mad Dog between the obstacles. I think that's the margin of victory here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I really, you know, I wrote down as well that, you know, I'm really impressed with how no problem is running here and your John really leaning on it a lot more. Uh, obviously, an old Bigfoot engine, which is stuff they're not running. Uh, apparently they're not running, you know, that engine anymore, so they're able to give it away. But, you know, to me what that says is, you know, they really transitioned from, um, you know, the, the engine that John's running here to much more power later and injection. But, you know, it's still a real, you know, serving a really great purpose for no problem and really kind of matches that truck about right. It does, and we see... No problem really gain the performance advantage throughout this 1990 season. They go on to call him the giant killer throughout the rest of the season as he ends up getting a couple big wins on the tour in the outdoor season. So wrapping up round number one, we're down now to eight trucks in the quarterfinals. And the first race around number two, things are going to get exciting in a hurry because we've got King Crunch versus Barely Tame, our technical fast qualifier versus a guy that seems to pour on the steam at the end of the track and that part of it kind of goes according to plan where scott gets a reaction time has a lead into the cars and then barely tame kind of really comes on strong at the end again once he lands on the cars but in the shutdown area that's when things start to go awry yeah i really like this run from king crunch uh, i think he he did the uh, the mound probably his best of uh, of the night so far and really nice makes a nice shot right into the set of cars jumps to right about the finish line as you mentioned and uh barely tame i mean just kind of he just kind of chases you down he does and chase you down and maybe even run into you in the shutdown area and that's what happens here because we we have contact between the two trucks both trucks kind of go toward the middle in the shutdown area and the right front of barely tame ends up tagging the left rear of king crunch and king crunch's tire kind of drives up and over that of barely tame kind of avoiding a severe accident like what had happened the previous weekend in roanoke between gravedigger and equalizer we see barely tame pull away from that accident and the tie rods broken on the front end and the front fender looks like it may have taken some damage but they're lucky that they really didn't tangle up any more than they did yeah what well, you know i noticed uh, quite a bit in this era during these type of courses is this was something that happened you know every other show or every third show or however you want to say it but it, it definitely happened where the somebody would come towards the center and uh, there would always be sort of a little tag of the tires every once in a while get into the body but mostly it was a, a tire tag and but then you would see how um how hard the hits really were because it would break the trucks they really did and i find it interesting with such a wide arena here that tnt has to work with they still kept the lanes so close i've got some footage from the following year in 1991 when u.s hot rod did the show here at the salt palace that should be up on my channel here within the next number of weeks from when this airs and they really spread the lanes out a little bit further apart between you know the the left and right lane to kind of give the trucks a little bit more room to work with and be a little bit safer maybe that was part of the allure of tnt the trucks are right side by side with each other but in some cases you're going to have some contact and speaking of contact the next race usa one and tough enough wilkie's got the whole shot and he kind of gets the the winning margin on that basis because Pablo's got that great come from behind effort again. He got over it smooth over that hill, but the two dive toward the center again. And this time we've got even bigger problems because the right front of Tough Enough goes right up into the driver's door of USA One. Shake hands with danger. Not only does it damage the USA One truck that's already wounded, but it completely blows the front end of Tough Enough apart. Broken knuckle. And, and we've got damage all over the Salt Palace. Yeah, this is a really cool run. Uh, very just, to me, very TNT-esque um, with, with the USA 1 kind of, you know, to me, uh, another just um, another run coming over the mound and hitting the cars, just completely different than all the rest of his runs. Couldn't really get 
um, you know, any consistency down of how he wanted to do that course. I'm sure it was really hard uh, to do, but, you know, here, he, you know, he comes over the roller, kind of has like a little wheelie jump where the truck's kind of um, at an angle towards the center, obviously. And uh, Tough Enough's been running so well all night that he can't get out of it. And Tough Enough just, they just come in and collide. And, you know, as you mentioned, that's uh, kind of, a, a hit on the, on the door of USA One, I believe, uh, which now he has to go home and change that door too. Yeah, a lot of damage on USA One. We almost see Pablo Cruz go through the windshield a tough enough too. He's bouncing all over the cab of that truck. I don't know how he stayed in, in place, but we see him get out of the truck and kind of surveying the damage after the run along with Scott Stevens. He's there to take a look, and I'm sure – Steve Wilkie wasn't too happy about it either because he's taken the helmet off. Uh, maybe he's asking if everybody's okay, but he sure doesn't look happy as he often did in 1990. No, the, um, a fantastic character, uh, Steve Wilkie, for these uh, for these events. Uh, I've talked before. I, I loved his interviews uh, just because it it really added something to the show. I thought, and I thought he did a good job of trying to get that. USA One name out there, their sponsors. He understood uh, the business and where they were at and what he was trying to do, but um, he didn't take anything from anybody. You know, he he was uh, he was in his own world and in terms of his competition, his competitive mindset, and just kind of a fun guy to to people watch. Very much a true competitor, and you could tell that he wore his heart on his sleeve. When he wasn't doing well, you knew about it, and when he was doing well, you knew about it. So the USA One truck, it looks like, is going to maybe move on to the next round here because I don't know if uh, if Pablo Cruz is going to be able to come back. And, and either way, it looks like USA One might have got to the line first in the first place. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I thought uh, Steve put in a little better run there with USA 1 than Tough Enough. I don't know if that was Tough Enough's best run. Uh, you know, a um, little bit of a mistake, I think, in that run compared to his other ones. But, man, that thing really uh, kind of tore apart on impact there. And like you said, he almost came out of the windshield or the sunroof. or um, He was bouncing all over the place in there. He was. All right, we're going to move to our next matchup, and this is two of the, the heavy hitters. We've got Bigfoot versus Awesome Kong, and we've got the big engine in Awesome Kong, the good suspension in Bigfoot, and both trucks kind of take the hill a little bit cautious but still quickly, and the the difference here, I think, it, between the obstacles, we see the lighter weight of Bigfoot just allows the truck to accelerate quicker and get that launch over the cars. I think Awesome Kong had a great run in the other lane. It's just not enough to, to compare to Bigfoot 8. Yeah, absolutely. I think when, you know, what I noticed is when Andy came over the hill here, uh, the truck didn't, it, it wanted to turn the, you know, kind of muscle the steering around a little bit on him here. You know, it kind of went left and then it went back right. And you could see it kind of had to gather just a second and uh, then kind of lay the power down, as you said. And and uh, he jumped on it and just about cleared the stack here. And I think this is Awesome Kong's probably his best run as well. Uh, but just kind of running into um, the the right truck for this kind of track. Got to be disheartening. You put in your fastest run of the night, and you still end up losing by that margin against the Bigfoot truck. And we see Andy Brass kind of backing up to go toward his pit space, and, oh, man, he knocks over the finish line pole. The, uh, Tommy kind of includes that footage as a little bonus. Yeah, I think it's funny how he kind of looks at it like he's just watching it fall like, whoa, boom. <laughs> Um, one thing I also I did here is I going back to Scott Stevens run a little bit earlier is I timed um, Scott Stevens run that I thought was really good. It was a 4.48. Uh, the run that Scott Stevens ran is what I had. And then, you know, that makeup run uh, Bigfoot did in qualifying 396. So, um, you know, they're running within a half a second of each other. But, you know, a half a second on a track like this is a ton. It really is a ton. You're talking about, you know. 10% of the run, you know, difference. That's, that's a whole more than a truck length in some cases. So our final round two race features two of our stalwarts here on TNT, T Nightlife and 
no problem. For me, I have this written down as one of the best races of the night because no problem gets a little bit of a whole shot, but then nightlife kind of comes back a little bit and the two leave the, the car ramps together and it just comes down to who has the larger jump and the power for no problem gets it done again. Yeah, you know, John is um, just doing so well on this track. I mean, I said it over and over again. He's got the hump down. Uh, the power in the truck suspension is about matched to each other. He's getting probably almost everything you can get out of this truck at this point. And uh, just impressive to watch and obviously not doing a lot of damage to this thing. And, you know, like you said, going show to show, trying to get as far as you can and, and making money. That's what it's all about, trying to get to that next show and make sure that we fill our pockets with cash on the way. We're heading to our semifinals, down to our final four, and we've got USA 1 versus King Crunch as our first matchup. And this is where we really start to see the difference in the confidence of Scott Stevens versus kind of the up and down night that Steve Wilkie's having because Stevens punches in a, a great reaction time, gets over that hill quick, and you see that Wilkie kind of realizes he's behind, and I think he kind of overdrives the rest of the track because he's trying to make up time. Yeah, it just kind of goes with his inconsistency of the night. Um, the truck is, is obviously is a very good performer power-wise, and him trying to determine what to do on that hill I think was his – uh, the toughest part uh, for him on this uh, on this track. And then maybe going back to Roanoke, like you said, he had just come off of a crash and just trying to get that confidence uh, kind of going again and, you know, not in and not wanting to make any mistakes and take it home wrecked. <laughs> or more wrecked in this case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And he really over jumps the mound that time I felt. And, um, you know, and then just was kind of in recovery mode the whole rest of the run and a little bit of a disappointing run in a way uh, because it it feels like he was trying to do something uh, to kind of upset Scott Stevens there and, and kind of, um, you know, put USA one in the finals, but uh, just didn't run all that smooth. Smooth will get it done on this track for sure. And the next matchup is going to be a battle of two guys that have been running pretty smooth all night we've got bigfoot and andy brass still working from that bottom half of the bracket up against john moore and no problem and moore leaves right with andy on the line and the suspension of bigfoot eight is what brings the win here in the semifinals for andy brass because between the obstacles the truck just takes off yeah you can see he's uh trying to get that timing down I think as you, know, you roll this mound and then when you want to apply the power um and kind of get on it. I'm not sure, you know, how these guys attack these tracks in terms of, you know, how they shifted, you know, and, and stuff with this thing. You, you know, take off in second and shift to third or, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not really a driver in these, but I wonder about those types of things quite a bit. These guys are definitely trying to get their rhythm down for sure. And what's going to be cool is, we're going to see how this progresses throughout the rest of the weekend, see if these times improve with your official Retro Monster Truck Review stopwatch that you've got there. So, Yeah, we're, we're, I, got, I got Andy. At a, he was a 378 in the, in the race before this. So. Mm -hmm. The times are certainly improving. Now, it's a big point of contention here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. We're at a TNT event. And we're going into what we call the Monster Smash Finals. And now I'm a big fan of the Monster Smash Final buildup. Our friend Josh, again, not on the show this week, the permanent host, he hates it. Now, what say you, Jason Rona? Oh, I love the Monster Smash Final. Josh is not here to put a veto on this. So here we go with the Monster Smash Final. We're going to pump the music in. It's been an incredible night of side-by-side -side competition, and we are down to the final two. It's time for the Monster Smash. It's final time. Scott has set us up here for the finals. Bigfoot and King Crunch. Man, two of the biggest guys on the tour heading into the finals on night number one here in Salt Lake City. And Stevens 
We'll cover his side of the track first. He's going to have what I would call about the perfect Leaf Spring truck run in that right lane because he gets the, the bounce. He gets the front end to trip up over the cars and stay nice and low and get that drive forward. But that other lane, Brass just puts the power down, stretches a half truck over King Crunch at the line. And Bigfoot's your winner. Yeah, absolutely. I thought Scott ran a really good run here. Um, you know, he he had been kind of working that right lane uh, all night long. And I think that, you know, he, he kind of really wanted to put Bigfoot on the trailer here, especially having probably the lane choice uh, and, you know, kind of going through the rounds. He, he probably felt some pressure to kind of defend. But, uh, but uh, you know, in the end, I think it's a little too much. Uh, Bigfoot was kind of uh, really at home on these type of tracks. And you can see here in this final that he, Andy kind of overjumped, I kind of thought, the the mound a little bit. And that actually, I think, you know, helped King Crunch stay in this race a little longer. Uh, but then he just kind of flies it to the finish line here. And like you said, one by like a half truck. And what I got is about a 3.8-ish <laughs> on the official uh, retro monster truck review uh, timing system. So a big improvement for Stevens in his time, but the consistency, even with maybe just a hair of a mistake with Andy Brass here, the time where he just puts the foot through the floorboard in the finals to get that big jump over the cars, that's going to be the difference here in night number one of our race at Salt Lake City. And we see Andy get out of the truck here as our winner in the finals here, and we get kind of a... a a wave to the crowd from Go Go the Gorilla, and we're going to close out show number one. Now, that's our Friday night show. We've got now to move to day number two, where we've got a Saturday afternoon show here in Salt Lake City. And show number two, we could see that there's already more people in the stands. We get a little bit of a prequel here with Rocky Mountain High and the, the little mini monster truck again, the Claude Buster doing some pre-show action. I just really miss the RC trucks being out there, part of the, the monster truck show, putting on a little bit of entertainment for the fans when the rest of the show is going kind of slower during intermission. Yeah, it's uh, it's like another having another go-go out there. It gives you something uh, that people can kind of zero in on and – uh, kind of forget about that there might be a little delay or something happening and gives them that opportunity, uh, you know, to to kind of just relax a little bit and uh, watch something a little different. But that's what the RC trucks are good for at these shows. And uh, the other thing I notice here is their banner placement inside this building with the TNT banners. Uh, there's a big heartbeat of America behind the, uh, the, uh, the start line. Um, they got their Goodyear banner over there and uh, Renegades, and I wonder if they had to put all these up in there, if the you know, if TNT Motorsports crew put that those up in there. I'm sure they did, part of the track crew duties, and having worked track crew for Monster Jam in the past, I can say that all those banners definitely have to be hung up by somebody, <laughs> and, and usually it ends up being the folks that are there kind of helping to volunteer for the weekend and, and get to see the show, so good work for all the sponsors here for TNT. We've got our driver intros again, and, and this time we've got maybe a little bit more shenanigans between the drivers and Gogo the Gorilla. There, are, John Moore's kind of stepping out of line, and Gogo has to keep him under under his wing and then Ken Deppy throws a handful of something at Gogo. -Go. I couldn't tell what it was and they go for a bit of a chase race throughout the whole Salt Palace. Yeah, they they had a nice bit worked out with Gogo -Go here and with the driver lineups and you know John Moore and like you said Ken uh Deppy getting in on it and I, I thought uh, whoever was playing Gogo -Go here um definitely did a great job I thought uh, interacting with the fans and the drivers uh, giving them a, a little bit of entertainment value here. For sure. We're going to kind of skip through qualifying here and just hit some of the high points of show number two. We've got Awesome Kong and Rocky Mountain High in the first matchup, and we see that the trucks are kind of taking it a bit easier. Not sure if these guys are looking to save the equipment because we've got another show here on Saturday night ready to go, uh, or maybe Sunday afternoon, can't remember which it is, but... Um, you know, we're in the middle of a three-show weekend here, so maybe the guys are just looking to take it a little bit easier as we go through the lineup. Master, uh, Master of Disaster and Mad Dog, the second lineup. The thing I see here is that maybe Spanier isn't one to totally write off yet after all. It looks like maybe he's starting to get that hill down. 
Yeah, I noticed that too. You know, I wrote him off after night one, but he rolls it nice here. He applies the power and gets a nice jump. And uh, and then Mad Dog actually got got a nice jump too. And uh, I kind of thought that thing was uh, destined to just be a a ground pounder, uh, you know, at this stage. But he got some nice air with Mad Dog and uh, Master of Disaster just kind of laid it down here. It had to be a nice qualifying run. Speaking of a nice qualifying run, the next matchup's got Bigfoot 8 in it, and Brass looking to pick up where he left off the night before, just putting in a nice, smooth, straight shot in Bigfoot number 8. Do we have a time on this one, Jason? We'll get one We'll get one here. What I noticed about this run is it came very close to clearing the cars. It seems like he got on the power a little more to make sure to get that, uh, uh, that TQ run, we'll call it, in RC terms. Yeah, it's a good run, nice straight run compared to the night before where he kind of got out of shape and had to come back for that rerun. So Andy finding a good balance and a good rhythm on this track here in Salt Lake City. Yeah, you know, getting that, that suspension working the way it was, you know, he's he's still in the in the high threes here on this run. I'd say he's run about three eight, three nine. Uh, but I thought that was his best jump uh, so far of the event. And the truck looks good, and I think, like you said earlier, I think they want to make sure that they're not going to break anything here because probably that turnaround to the next show is quick. And I notice his crewman, uh, which I guess would be Donnie, uh, really runs towards the truck every single time he finishes a pass and really inspects the bottom of it. I don't know if that was... Uh, because they were going through uh, kind of bending those four link bars at that time and having to go through a lot of that stuff. But I noticed Donnie's really all over that thing run after it lands. Got to make sure you have that thing ready to go for the next round. And if you can identify those problems quick and maybe, you know, get the truck back to the pits before the, the driver has to do his interview uh, out on the on the floor, maybe that could save you a few minutes. So they're definitely looking to make sure there's no damage underneath the Bigfoot 8 truck. We've got another pair, Nightlife and No Problem. Uh, just two good, consistent TNT runs here. It seems like these guys are facing each other a lot, even though this is just in qualifying. But... Good runs, no problem. Upper hand once again. Troublemaker back in the program for show number two. And up against Tough Enough, he's got that truck fixed. Pablo Cruz gets really bounced around the cab again over the cars, but he's going to put in the faster run. And hopefully Troublemaker can get a little bit more on pace here in day number two. Yeah, you know, it's nice to see uh, the guys getting used to the course and kind of figuring things out. I mean, the Troublemaker, nice looking truck, and it looks like it should be more competitive. And uh, maybe it's just getting used to the track. But yeah, over there in the other lane, I mean, I didn't expect them to get that thing uh, so repaired so quickly after the night one, but and he ran it hard. Rocky Mountain Thunder and Barely Tame in the next qualifying pair. And the story... Sticking the same with Barely Tame. Slow start, strong finish as the two kind of cross the finish line pretty close together. USA 1 and King Crunch. And we see, again, Wilkie trying to go for what I call the, the bounce and trip uh, move over the cars to try to get it done. Unfortunately, that further distance between No Man's Land, again, is going to catch Wilkie by surprise and the, the front end's going to hit the ramp. King Crunch getting the faster of those two runs. Yeah, you know, Wilkie's still trying to get this track down, as he pointed out. Just doesn't seem to have the consistency. Uh, King Crunch puts in just, it almost seems like he's automatically in that 4.3 uh, to 4.4 range with his truck here. And hard for him to go a little quicker, but he's, he's kind of beating up on everybody else with his consistency. And USA 1 kind of having a hard time stopping again, going deep into the tunnel. And um, just be nice to see him get kind of put a couple runs together here with that truck. Wilkie's definitely looking for the consistency for sure. Final qualifier, Whiskey Business and Ken Deppy. Solo run, pretty good run. Nothing really crazy. Nice straight run. Uh, the smoke starts coming out at the end again. But a pretty good run. I'd say it's definitely in the top half. Yeah, he's got his chimney finish. Uh, but this, uh, he just comes bouncing off of that last, uh, that last couple cars and uh, running it hard. Run it is uh, is a good run. We then see a little segment here of Scott Douglas interacting with Gogo the Gorilla, and and Gogo's doing his dance moves of how they do it in Salt Lake City. He's he's out there putting on a show for the fans. 
yeah, he he kind of does this little uh, this little skit where he uh, mentions like how does uh, how do people in Salt Lake walk? And he falls over, and Scott Douglas gets all mad, and then uh, it, it's it's a fun little skit he's got. Heading into round number one, and this time we see that it's definitely Andy Brass and Bigfoot that was our top qualifier because he's got the buy run in round number one. He puts in a good, smooth, fast run. I'd say at this point, Andy has got his rhythm down and he's got this course pretty well dialed in. Yeah, and we'll check him out here on time, you know, coming off of this run. Like we talked about earlier, not everybody presses it uh, in a uh, qualifier. But, uh, you know, Andy here, I think, just trying to get used to things. And he's, uh, you know, 378 on a buy run. Yeah, so really, really consistent here for Bigfoot. We talked about how some of the guys would hold back on a buy run, whereas Andy, I think, wants to keep his rhythm and keep his head in the game to make sure he does that same pass every time. Because if he can do that every time, he pretty much knows he's going to be a winner. Yeah, the truck just does the course so quickly, you know, compared to the others here. And uh, I think he knows he's got people pretty covered, but... um, I mean, being so short, anything can happen. And if you if you don't get your that roller right, any one of these uh, top trucks could definitely take them down. For sure. Speaking of a top truck, USA One and Rocky Mountain Thunder, the first round one matchup. And we see Rocky Mountain Thunder get a little bit of a jump off the line. But Wilkie able to kind of finally get a little smoother over that hump and is able to put the power down over the cars. Maybe not full blast, but enough to stay ahead of Rocky Mountain Thunder. And at the end of the run here, we see Wilkie again kind of having trouble getting it shut down in time, heading toward the tunnel. And we get a zoom in shot and we see how much damage this truck really has on it. Yeah, you know, I think he kind of gave up on your uh, on that method of the trip. Uh, tripping up of the uh, the rear wheels and kind of front wheeling across the cars. And he's like, okay, I'll just roll the hill and I'll punch the set. And and, um, and this is probably his most, his cleanest run, I guess you could say. And then, uh, like you said, zoom in on the truck and just see all the damage from that end over end crash in Roanoke. Yeah, the truck is looking a lot worse for wear, for sure. And it's enough to get him through round number two, and and that's the name of the game here, trying to go more rounds in the TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Our next matchup, Tough Enough versus Troublemaker, a TNT race, if you will. Um, We see Troublemaker still kind of having problems with that bounce off of the hill, and Tough Enough just put in a decent run uh, and an easy win for Pablo Cruz. He's going to move on to round number two. Yeah, it's tough enough, seems pretty stiff and rigid, but he's not afraid to just drive it into uh, the ramps or the hill, even when it's stiff. And he just kind of he just kind of deals with what happens with that reaction. And uh, the truck looks like it's powered pretty well. It's not breaking here in this run. And uh, he didn't come out of the cab this time. His head kind of stays in, uh, <laughs> in the general area. He belted himself in a little bit tighter for round number one. The next matchup, Tube Strong Chevrolets. One a long bed, one a short bed. We've got Wild Hair versus Master Disaster. Wild Hair going to get way out of shape coming after that that hill. It looks like the truck kind of bucks forward and back, and that's what gets him out of shape. In the other lane, though, Master Disaster putting in a pretty good run, and it looks like, again, Spaniard's starting to dial the track in. Yeah, he's kind of sticking it to me here now. He's getting that roller down and, uh, you know, taking about a 4.6 second lap here that's basically what Wilkie ran in the, in the race before so uh you know these guys run 4.6 Scott Stevens down in the 4.4 to 4.3 range and then Wild Hair just not really doing too much just not quite able to put that power down again maybe a tuning problem at the high altitude because he's running that injection and maybe didn't have the right pill for that system so next matchup Barely tame and no problem. Two of the more interesting trucks here on the weekend so far in terms of running well. And John Moore is going to kind of ride a small wheelie off of that bounce into the car ramp. And he's going to go do his best Dennis Anderson impression from Freedom Hall where he kind of bounces into that car stack and just puts the front end skyward. Thankfully, he didn't back out of it, though, because he sails the truck vertically through the air ahead of Barely Tame, who's putting on a strong finish as always. Yeah, that's the um, the drawback to getting your timing wrong over that roller. If it bounces, the front end bounces right on the face of that uh, car stack, then you go in right into a wheelie, you know, a la the Dennis Anderson 
um, the run uh, that you're mentioning. And then the one he did there, was it in Buffalo, when the front just settles right on the uh, the face right. of the jump and yeah. jumps jumps out into outer space. But um, yeah, that uh, John Moore had a Dennis Anderson-esque run there. And man, he's just, I, I really love the way he's running here this whole weekend. He's really, really running strong, especially so far from home. It had to be a good feeling there for for John and Heidi to go out and run this well against some of these top trucks for sure. Next matchup is going to be Whiskey Business and Rocky Mountain High. And again, Rocky Mountain High, not quite enough torque to get the big jump over that hill. Once Deppy sees that he's got a lead here, I think he kind of takes it a little bit easy over the cars and just kind of maintains the lead enough to go into the next round. Yeah, he definitely takes it easy, that's for sure, and um, we'll get him a, an official time here. But, yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the the smoke rolls out here regardless for him. Turns about a 576, so about a second behind even uh, USA 1, but it gets him in the next round. Hey, he only got to run hard enough to beat the next guy, right? So we'll that's see right. how he comes back in round number two. Awesome Kong and Mad Dog going to be our penultimate round number one race. Kong's going to get a little bit of a better drive between the cars. He doesn't get to bounce in as much as Mad Dog does, and it ends up being a truck length advantage at the finish line. Yeah, the truck, uh, awesome, actually working really well here. I think kind of got the track down a little bit more than uh, he had in some of the previous rounds, and uh, he's looking to try to go deep into this field today. Final race of round number one, Nightlife and King Crunch. I've got this circled as as my best race of round number one because it's a good race. King Crunch has an early lead, and then both of them kind of stay lower over the cars trying to get that forward momentum. Nightlife comes on strong, but most of that coming on strong happens after the finish line, and King Crunch is going to be the one that actually gets to the line first, it looks like. Yeah, to me, this is just a, a nightlife run where you can't get any more out of the truck. This is all it has, and uh, he just tries to go rounds as, as far and as deep as he can go, getting that, um, you know, the the round uh, money, round bonuses, and King Crunch just trying to be fast enough to um, to get into the next round and, and, and see if he can kind of pull off some magic here. Speaking of magic. It's magic for the crowd in terms of the marquee matchup. Bigfoot and USA 1, this has got to be on paper the matchup that people came to see here in Salt Lake City, two of the superstars at this time. And it looks like a dream matchup, but it turns quickly into a mismatch. Yeah, you can see kind of where they were at this point, you know, in, uh, <clears throat> you know, going back through the history, obviously, you know, the, the 88 stuff, the 89 stuff, and then um, coming out with Bigfoot 8 here in – uh, just looking like a completely different uh, vehicle. Uh, it, it takes off well, and you can see, I don't think he's even pushing the truck all the way here, just kind of doing enough to win. Does another 3.8, and uh, actually dives to the tunnel here, kind of blocks Steve so he can't go into the tunnel. And he looks like he's heading right to the pit area, too. He doesn't even stop on the way out. I'll call this the, the first death knell for USA <laughs> 1 here uh, against Bigfoot 8, where you know, when we go to Memphis in 1991 and Bigfoot 8 just slaughters USA 1 at that Jamboree race, that was kind of like the day USA 1 died for me because mm -hmm. they finally realized how outmatched they were against these new trucks. But this had to be one of the nails in that coffin. Yeah, they, if they had video of this and they came back and watched, they're like, I don't know what you're going to do here, um, you know, against this. And, you know, we at this point, USA 1 still has probably the larger engine. Um, I don't know when they made that engine change in Bigfoot. You know, that might be something we can talk about. But, um, you know, and, and Steve actually ran. I thought he did a nice job with this run. Uh, he rolled the hill nice, jumped the set of cars, but uh, he didn't. You know, try to do the uh, the pop, <laughs> whatever whatever we were calling the pop and trip. Um, yeah, but uh, he ran a good run, but uh, just not enough. Again, yeah, like you said, the suspension is the difference here because Wilkie puts in a good run and he still just gets his clock cleaned by Bigfoot. And uh, you talk about the engines. USA One's got the big five seventy two. What was Bigfoot running like a four ninety six? I think at that point. Yeah, I think there's some um, some debate, right, whether what they were running at this time, because I think they started running the truck with a 540 
or or something like that. And then um, later on in, in TNT, you know, in Albuquerque is when Andy announced that they went to the uh, the other engine. They went to a 496. So the question is, was he running the 496 here? Or was he still on the? Because uh, uh, I think they're running injection at this point, 540 or on injection, then went to the 496 on it. In injection um but i don't know if it was this show or the very next show not sure about that one it's good it could be either um i know when they started with bigfoot eight i think they were running a carbureted setup pretty early on with it weren't they yeah i think it looked like they put the the triple predator style engine in the truck and um but i don't know that they ever ran it like that with a body on it I think uh, once they finally put a body on it, I think is when it had the injection and everything fit below mm -hmm. the body, right? I believe so. I don't think I've ever seen the carbs peek out through the hood of, of Bigfoot 8 there, mostly just in testing. Our next round number two race, quarterfinals, is going to be between Tough Enough and Master of Disaster, two good-looking red trucks heading out here in round number two. And Master of Disaster gets a little bit of a small jump off the line, but tough enough with that smooth style between the obstacles is going to make up the, the time and take about, what, a half truck length lead. Yeah, I like what tough enough's doing. Uh, obviously, staying after it. He broke the truck the night before, uh, but he's staying after it really hard here. And Master kind of messes up the roller here. This kind of his first trip up of the night. Uh, he had been really nailing that and putting in good runs. I thought he was probably the third fastest truck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after Bigfoot, King Crunch, and then I thought he was probably about the third quickest truck, but makes a little mistake here, and then uh, old Tough Enough just kind of makes it happen. Again, I'm calling Tough Enough the breakout star of the weekend so far. You don't see him much on TV, but here in Salt Lake City, he's just going rounds. Maybe not winning the whole show, but he's going rounds. Next matchup, Whiskey Business and No Problem. We just see more Good consistency out of John Moore. Whiskey business gets to bouncing in the mid-range. The smoke starts pouring out yet again, and no problem. Good smooth run. Going to head to that next round. Yeah, this whiskey business is definitely a smoke show. And, you know, you got uh, John Moore just putting in another clean run. Roller, stab it, makes his nice jump, and uh, settles down. No breakage. You know, whiskey kind of is rattling and bouncing all over the place and probably... Happy to be done for the night. <laughs> yeah, you ain't kidding. Our next matchup, we're going now. Well, it looks like maybe we skip a race because we would have had King Crunch and Awesome Kong. We don't get to see it. It appears maybe that King Crunch won that race based on what we're going to have here in the semifinals. So a bummer we didn't get to see that matchup, but we're going to head into the semifinals anyway with Bigfoot going up against Tough Enough. Now, well, I'm calling tough enough your breakout star of the weekend, but we still got the full star that he's going up against here with Bigfoot. And Brass just stomps all over tough enough, and tough enough puts in probably his worst run of the weekend. Yeah, didn't have a great run. You know, Andy's kind of got this track really figured out. The car, the truck does go to the right here a little bit. Um, you know, he's still in the 3.8 range. He's just kind of settling in on a three in that 3.8 uh time and uh, puts another guy on the trailer and uh, donnie's just checking the truck out right when it lands uh, just all over the front looking at that thing and uh i was kind of impressed by seeing that it was nice to see that um you know they were definitely very proactive here uh looking that thing over and uh, trying to get if there was any repairs kind of get started as you mentioned ahead of time but uh tough enough yeah he kind of messed up the run probably um, knowing that he had to get a little extra out of it in order to uh, move past this round, but he tried it. That smooth rhythm just got upset a little bit. But overall, I mean, you make the semifinals at a TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Not a bad showing, especially when you go down to the Bigfoot. So our next second semifinal matchup is King Crunch and No Problem. This has got to be the race of the event. You know, this second day event for me so far, because both of them have good, hard runs. No real big mistakes here. Um, very, very close finish. And 
King Crunch looks like maybe just gets it by what half a tire or so, and then no problem. Kind of goes for a little bit of a wild ride in the shutdown area, doing its best whiskey business impression. Absolutely, throws on his own smoke show. Uh, probably his roughest or. Uh, most aggressive land of the night, just a little squirrely. He was normally over there on that right lane, so he got thrown to the left lane by Scott. He wants to stay in that right lane, and uh, I thought uh, John ran a really good run here. King Crunch, maybe not quite the, the best uh, run of, of the night for him, but it was definitely good enough to, to get the win, as it appears, in, in going into the finals. Not just the finals. It's the Monster Smash Finals, day number two in Salt Lake City. Here we go. All right, here we go. Final time, Bigfoot versus King Crunch. This is a rematch of last night's final and hate to tell you spoiler alert the outcome gonna be no different bigfoot stomping king crunch king crunch bounces kind of into the face of the cars like we've been talking about here and just doesn't quite get the rhythm right kills all of his forward momentum and andy brass is now two for two on the weekend yeah you could see here uh andy got to stay in the right lane he'd been running there um a lot and to me it, what it shows is you know scott stevens was still worried about getting to the finals because he never switched lanes you know he he pretty much knew he was going to be um running against bigfoot potentially and never really tried this left lane he stayed over there in the right i believe and bigfoot ran the right the whole time and he just kind of assumed um you know hey i'm gonna go to the final i need to get to the finals first i guess is the his mindset we get an interview here, a winner's interview with Scott Douglas and Andy Brass that Tommy had recorded. And I find it interesting that Andy mentions that he's six shows behind everybody else in the points and that they're starting to catch up. I wonder if maybe they had two full weekends off during this first quarter where they weren't racing with TNT. And, you know, it's interesting that Andy kind of brings that up because the, the narrative that we get is that Bigfoot had dominated so much. But really, it seems here that he's kind of playing catch up in the points race. Yeah, there's some things that I don't quite understand the way they kind of, if you followed it on TV, how they kind of, uh, the narrative of, of, of the uh, the series and the reality of the amount of, of events that these trucks were running or where they were racing. Um, you know, I know before there was, um, you know, Equalizer hadn't ran all the events or, you um, you know, Carolina Crusher's first uh, one when he showed up. And it's like not everybody ran every single event. So um, and then Andy mentioning six shows behind and they're doing pretty good for six shows behind. But it's not it's not like you dominated every single race that you uh, on, on the calendar. Yeah, you know, Andy had a lot of trouble in the Astrodome that first night and, and went out real early. I think he won the second night. But it hasn't been a complete blowout for Bigfoot so far this season. They've they've been getting a lot of wins, and even so, they're only taking you know X number of finishes for your point series for TNT as well. So you didn't have to necessarily race every single weekend across the country to be in it for the points race. You just had to run that minimum amount of events and do well at them. And what's cool is we see the points on the TNT tough track show and how accurate those points were at that time. I'm not sure. It seems like they kind of, you know, would add in the points from other shows because we'd see trucks that weren't on TV every week up there in the top 10. And when Bigfoot gets banned, I think in Albuquerque, Brass had just taken over the points lead at that point. So maybe they really were behind a few shows if they were still counting all of them up to that point of the season. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, that, probably makes a little bit of sense because it took like you said all the way to albuquerque to get back into the lead when um you know they just kept saying you're dominating you're dominating you're dominating but it's like hey you're not even in the points lead yet um yeah. so you're clearly a, a few shows behind and uh, you know you know obviously they needed to um spark up the interest a little bit too and i'm sure there was a, a big a big side a uh, big part of it to that where they needed to kind of play up um you know that side of things but uh the truck was clearly running well especially indoors 
And uh, I think what most people, this is probably where the um, Scott Stevens started to get really frustrated now. He's, he's two shows in, uh, taking second both nights um, uh, to Bigfoot here in the truck um, that uh, he starts to kind of make us think about uh, not really liking being on the tour. But, you know, looking at the times here, uh, Andy ran about a 3.6 to 3.7 there in that final run. So he definitely ran his best run of the night there in the finals. Not to mention, we remember race number one of this weekend where Stevens put in pretty much a perfect run in the eyes of that truck, and it still just wasn't enough to beat Bigfoot. So we can definitely assume that Stevens' frustration is starting to build on the weekend here. Two times in the finals against Bigfoot and two losses. But we've got one more show. Maybe he can get a reprieve. Show number three on the weekend, and we start this video again from Tommy with more action of the Rocky Mountain High Claude Buster doing some more of that full-scale car crushing and putting on a good show for that crowd once again during the pre-show activities. The Rocky Mountain High Mini Junior, we'll call it. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, yeah, he's freestyling it out there. He takes a nice header off of the cars, and the truck keeps on going. And, uh, man, those Claudes, you just can't kill them. Man, that's about the most durable stock Claude Buster I've ever seen. I think if I dropped it off the front of my car, uh, one of those things would break a knuckle or an axle tube or something. But, man, he's got that thing working just really, really well in the Salt Palace, putting on a show for the fans, flying the American flag on the top. And you could hear the crowd really get into it when something cool happens with the truck. Yeah, you know, and that was something I kind of thought about earlier, um, you know, going back to the crowd a little bit is um, – you know how Scott Douglas was pumping um, the the Bigfoot truck there a little bit that it was a new truck and all that type of thing and how the crowd really responded to um, basically Scott Douglas saying watch this run you know and he like basically clears the cars and people were there was definitely um, in these days what it started thinking about was uh, the crowd needing sort of that. Um, it was nice to have that superhero out there to look forward to. There was a lot of battles going on, but um, the the placement in all these trucks, the um, it seemed like it really kind of was nice for telling a story or saving something for the end uh, for people to be impressed with. It really is a good telling of the story, and that's why Scott Douglas and guys like Army Armstrong were the best at what they did because they were able to kind of bring that storyline to the people there live and tell you what has happened and you know where we're going and what's happening throughout the night where – it really gets the fans engaged and involved in the outcome of the event, not just necessarily of this night alone, but this entire tour that we're doing that's adding up to something at the end of the year. Yeah, it's like they could they were kind of setting this up where if you wanted to cheer the Bigfoot truck on because it was new and special and quick, they were allowing you to kind of prepare and get ready for that. Or if you wanted to take as a fan take the other side of it and and make that the villain, uh, you could do that and you could kind of cheer for the more underdog. So they kind of gave them almost roles here. Um, you know, the USA one, he had a role and they were kind of uh, establishing some roles for these different trucks and uh, in the make the crowd decide which way you were going to go. The crowd reaction definitely showing the support during the driver introductions as well. We get another shot of the spotlight of the drivers running around. We get Andy Brass kind of doing a, a dance here with Gogo as he gets introduced and heading over to the Bigfoot truck. And the, the final run of introductions here, really, really cool to see these guys getting the recognition. And you know, a lot of the shows still do that today. Uh, you know, I'm not going to knock everybody and, and say that. You know, this isn't happening. It's it's just a really cool thing I like to see, especially from back in the day, how they used to do this kind of stuff and bring them all out just one at a time. The trucks aren't even running. I, I think it may even build a little bit more suspense because the trucks are just kind of like quiet and ready to be unleashed, so to speak. Yeah. Um, now they, they like to give you sort of that um, that shakeup factor, uh, rolling them all in. And I think that's a – it's a nice um, – way to open the show i've noticed uh, the way they do it today but that there was also something to be said for that quiet opening introducing the drivers and then when they actually run them uh, over the stuff um 
it's it's kind of a surprise. Getting into some qualifying highlights here from show number three. We've got Awesome Kong and Mad Dog both putting in nice smooth runs. King Kong just a little bit faster. Wild Hair and no problem. Two more smooth runs, no problem getting the upper hand over Marvin Smith and Wild Hair, who looks like it still doesn't quite have that throttle set uh, set up, you know, kind of figured out. And then the third qualifier, Troublemaker and Rocky Mountain Thunder. We see that these guys are starting to really get the track kind of figured out because we're starting to have more and more smooth runs. One more from Rocky Mountain Thunder and Troublemaker, even though the run is just a little slower, he it's probably his smoothest run of the weekend. Yeah, I thought so too. He did a good job there. He really got the, the roller right. And I'm sure that it, depending on if they worked on it every night or not, I doubt it. You know, that roller was probably getting more round and less flat on top. So you could probably make a nice, a little better transition. And uh, yeah, I, I really liked the way the Troublemaker ran that one. Nice and smooth and uh, uh, looked good. And then, you know, the other truck over there, Rocky Mountain <laughs> Thunder, um, his almost his best run. They're all starting to look good here in show number three. We've got USA one and Rocky Mountain High, and Wilkie's going to put in what it may be the fast time of, of qualifying so far. Rocky Mountain High traveling behind again. Um, we get a nice zoom in shot of Rocky Mountain High as well, and then we see those two heading back to the pits. Yeah, you know, I wanted to um, get a little time here on USA one because I thought it was a really good run. Uh, you know, Steve kind of went back and just said, hey, I'm just going to do the uh, the simple start here. And, you know, he's in the 4-5 range. 4.5, that's not too bad for qualifying overall. It's going to probably put you, what, top three more than likely. So our next matchup, and it's our finals matchup from the first two shows, maybe a prelude to what's going to happen later in the show, Bigfoot and King Crunch. And... The two of these guys here have very, very close runs. I'd say King Crunch, one of the best runs of the weekend so far. And Bigfoot doesn't really look like he's holding back. Brass kind of going for the full moonshot over the cars. And I'd say now we've got the two top times in qualifying. Yeah, we do. I think, uh, you know, to me, getting getting Bigfoot on the clock here is right at about 3.9 or 4.0. I thought a little bit behind for him of where he had been. But uh, I really thought King Crunch put in a great run here. This may give Scott Stevens a little bit of a reprieve or some confidence to say, you know what, maybe I really can hang with this Bigfoot truck. If I get a nice good run in once again, maybe I can take him out further on down the bracket. Yeah, you know, when like you said, you only if you're only a, a tenth or two off, uh, it doesn't take much for the other truck to uh, to have an error, and, and you can and you can win it. The two Minnesota team trucks going against each other and qualifying for time. We've got Mer Barely Tame, Master of Disaster, both looking, you know, pretty decent. Barely Tame gets the better launch, but Master of Disaster coming back hard over the cars, and I think he's going to end up with the better qualifying time. Yeah, Master really lays it down right here, and um, especially once he hits that car and the landing. I was a little scared for him there for a second. Uh, the way the truck landed off at the end, I thought, it, you know, it could it was just barely it could have uh, clipped that rear car with the rear tire and then he could be going nose over. Tough enough in whiskey business, the next pair to qualify. We've got two decent runs here. Whiskey business actually going to be the faster of the two. And it seems you know, Pablo Cruz started off the weekend so smooth and so strong and kind of carried that through show two. But everybody else has improved. And now some of the guys are starting to eclipse his elapsed times over this track. Yeah, whiskey business. Nice run here. Um, you know, put a lot of effort into it and tough enough. Just kind of, you know, nosedived really hard over the over the cars and and the truck almost looked like it was uh, just not quite as good as it had been in the previous couple shows. Just a little bit off, like you said. People catching up, other drivers and whiskey coming out really nice and um, tough enough. Not as Good of a run there. I wasn't sure it was whiskey business in the other lane for a second because there's no smoke coming out of that truck over the finish line. Maybe they changed some gaskets or something from the day before. Yeah, it did not let the smoke out that time, <laughs> and uh, and it ran well. Let's see here. Our final qualifier, again, Nightlife, going to get a solo run, and maybe why Sore thought that 
he was not qualifying and thought he had a buy run because he really takes it easy here. I'm not sure why he goes so slowly throughout the track, maybe just, you know, trying to get himself into the program. Maybe there was a mechanical issue somewhere, but he really just limps over the cars. Yeah, 768 is definitely not going to cut it um, in the field here. Between rounds here, before race or round number one, we get more Rocky Mountain Junior action with what might be the first recorded stunt moonwalk uh, yeah. of, a, of an RC monster truck because he really just puts that thing on the nose and is, is steering it back and forth, putting on a show for the fans. Really, really cool action here from our entertainment uh, during the intermission time. Yeah, it's either him or uh, uh, James Hetfield from Metallica, uh, you know, on YouTube putting in that first uh, stoppy action. Yeah, we've got Bigfoot, our top qualifier once again. And as we talked about before, Brass is not going to take it easy on a buy run. He wants to stay in that rhythm, and he puts in a good, smooth, fast run. Maybe even overdrove the hill just a hair, but he kind of uses that to his advantage and almost pulls that leaf spring bounce into the cars and kind of keeps the truck a little bit lower over the, the set of cars this time. And Man, just really looks like he's got his rhythm down and, and maybe one of his faster times of the weekend. I'm not sure. What's the stopwatch say, Jason? We're still in the 3.8 range. Um, the, the fastest he went, up to me, um, appears to be that final round in show two against King Crunch, but um, that's another good run right there. I like he's, I like how you said that he um, kind of you know did that leaf spring move almost into the, the first set of cars and the truck uh, took a different type of jump that time. First head-to-head -head race of round number one, we've got Mad Dog and Rocky Mountain Thunder, two of the shorter wheelbase trucks here at the event. Kind of just a nice smooth run for Bob Brain. He's going to slowly open up a lead throughout the entire run. Nothing spectacular, nothing crazy out of either truck, really. It's just Mad Dog putting in a nice smooth run for the win. Yeah, that's another truck, like you said, right in line with the the – the nightlifes and that type of thing where they just do what the truck can do. And if that's enough, that round, they move on. Next matchup is Rocky Mountain High versus Master of Disaster. We kind of know the script by now. Rocky Mountain High is going to get kind of a slow start over that hill, and that's going to allow the opponent to kind of get out to a lead. And, boy, you didn't have to tell Doug Spanier to hold back at all because he's going to punch in just an amazing run Despite the fact that he has kind of almost no competition, he's across the line before Valdez even gets to the ramp for the cars. Now, I have the non-official uh, Retro Monster Truck Review stopwatch here on my phone. I've got this set at a 3.9 second run, which would match Bigfoot's buy run. Exactly, yeah. And uh, that's, that's what I got as well. And definitely the best run that he's put in so far. And uh, uh, second best run probably of the entire weekend. The truck just sounds so good in this run, too. You can really hear the the engine power really ramping up, and the RPMs are just through the roof on the Master Disaster Chevrolet. Yeah, especially when it just, you know, it kind of drives right into the face of that thing and kind of revs real hard. Yeah, good run. You can hear him burp the throttle again, kind of coming off the cars as well, where we've got, you know, this just really, really killer run from Master Disaster. And we'll see if he can take that momentum and, and kind of go the rest of the way through the event, because if he can do that run every time, he's in the finals, if not maybe right with Bigfoot in the finals, you know, if Bigfoot doesn't make any mistakes. So we'll keep an eye on Master Disaster through the rest of this bracket. Absolutely. It'd be nice to see him kind of, he, he kind of started uh, pretty slow in uh, show one, but he's really kind of figuring out the course and uh, the truck's got the power to do it. Some more go-go action, kind of playing chicken with Awesome Kong as he heads to the line here, and he's going to go up against Tough Enough. A lot of red trucks here at this event at the TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Two more of them here, Awesome Kong and Tough Enough, and this is kind of where we start to see Tough Enough fall flat. He doesn't get a good start. Awesome Kong's got the power in the left lane and just gets that early hole shot, and Tough Enough can't make up the difference by the time they get to the finish line. Yeah, he probably, you know, got to this point in the weekend, maybe we're, you know, he was thinking, hey, I, I gave it everything I got, I've, I've broken the truck a couple times, or, you know, I've kind of done it all here so far this weekend, and I'm ready to kind of pack it in. 
<laughs> Speaking of packing it in, Wilkie almost packs it into the wall of the Salt Palace in the next race. We've got USA 1 versus Wild Hair, and Wilkie puts in a good run, but he stays on the throttle pretty long past the finish line and kind of has to dodge the hay bales in the corner of the tunnel there at the Salt Palace to avoid a major accident. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This uh, this truck is fast on the on the back end of these tracks, and uh, you know he's down into the lower fours now. That was about a that was a four point one five, and uh, you know definitely going a little bit quicker. Uh, but he's having a hard time stopping the truck, and um, yeah, that that could be a problem. Definitely could be a problem. One could say that he may shake hands with danger before the end of this one. Next matchup going to be Nightlife versus No Problem. These two have matched up yet again here on the weekend. It seems like these two have been racing each other the whole weekend, whether it be qualifying or in eliminations. And it seems like the outcome is the same once again. John Moore putting in just that little bit extra to stay ahead of Dave Wysork. Both have good runs, and it's just maybe the horsepower in No Man's Land. Do you think that's a difference? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's um, he's got the little quicker truck, it seems. And just uh, even though I, I, I thought like um, it, that he made a little mistake on the roller that time, which I think allowed Nightlife to catch up a little bit. But, you know, Dave definitely stayed in it all the way through that time. He was, uh, I think, going for the win there, uh, but just didn't come, didn't come true. Next matchup going to be Whiskey Business versus Troublemaker. But before that, we see Marvin Smith kind of hop onto a forklift and starts driving it toward the tunnel. And my guess is that Marvin's going to kind of use the equipment to help him get his truck tired down here since he's out of competition for the weekend now. Yeah, I saw him just kind of just at first I thought he was just going to sit in there and that like become his uh, spectator seat. Guess he had some work to do though, because we see him take off with the thing, and uh, maybe they're using it to get the tires in the hauler easier or, or off the truck. But hey, you use whatever you can if it'll help you get the job done quicker. Marvin's out for the the event now. He takes the round one loss, and presumably not the fast qualifier either. So you know, or, or fast loser. So he's gonna just go ahead and get started on tearing the truck down. Next matchup going to be Whiskey Business and Troublemaker, like we said, and Whiskey Business going to take a, a number of bounces here, but it's still going to be enough, and it looks like we've uh, popped the gasket again because the smoke shows back. Yeah, he uh, he was definitely giving them the business in this run. Uh, ran it a lot harder than I, kind of what I was expecting when I first saw this video, and like you said, bounced it up several times and then opened up the smoke show. He was giving him the business, the whiskey business, per se, going into the next round with the George Dickel Tennessee Sippin' Whiskey Machine. Uh, one of the more interesting sponsors that we've ever had in monster truck racing. Uh, you can still get George Dickel Sour Mash Whiskey. I, they have it at our liquor stores here. I've never tried it, but I kind of almost want to just to say that I have and kind of – you know, get my 30 year delay on the sponsorship there from the whiskey company that was helping out the Breen boys. Yeah. I mean, probably a pretty good sponsor. Um, in those days, every, obviously everybody wanted a sponsor, but, um, a nice sponsor to have and, you know, huge on the truck, but I've never tried it myself either, but it would be nice to have a personal experience with it. Uh, just kind of help and support the cause, right? That's right. But we're a little late to the party, but we're at the party nonetheless. Yeah. Next matchup in round number one, we've got King Crunch and we've got looks like Master of Disaster. So or excuse me, Barely Tame, the other Minnesota truck, Barely Tame in the left lane. And we've got another strong finish for Barely Tame, but that strong finish just comes a little bit too late because King Crunch has been running so good all weekend, especially tonight. He was able to get that early jump and to the point where Barely Tame just couldn't reel him back in. Yeah, he's over there doing his four fours, four fives all night long and uh, moving on to the next round. That's going to be, it looks like, the end of round number one, and we get some more uh, kind of a uh, little bit of – showboating here from Gogo the Gorilla and a little skit with Scott Douglas where Gogo had ordered a pizza and it got delivered, but 
there's no pizza in the box. Who took the pizza? The, it, Gogo's not too happy about it. And then we see Ken Deppy kind of walking down through the arena floor, eating a piece of pizza, and the, the craziness ensues. Yeah, I mean, Gogo was excited about getting that Domino's pizza, and here comes Ken Deppy, you know, with a with uh, stealing his pizza, and he throws it to him. He, he takes a bite and then just throws it at him. He, he left the crust for him, he says. Yep. And, man, it's, it's got to be a, a cool thing. I mean, I never got to see Gogo. I'm a little bit too young. But I've been to a lot of shows where we had a similar kind of character, Bobby Cox. I've been to a lot of shows where Bobby Cox was at doing his clown routine. And it was just so entertaining. And I wish that I got to see it more often again because it really – adds a little bit of a different vibe to the event it, not just necessarily the hardcore competition but we're making sure that everybody's having fun too yeah and you know they kind of take it a step further here and they throw them in the the trunk of one of the junk cars and just kind of bullying them here oh they done my man go go dirty even the tnt officials are helping stuff go go into the trunk of the car as some kind of uh, hazing thing i don't know what the deal is but they lock them in and ken deppy's telling them to fire the truck up and run over the cars but the, the uh they they have a change of heart it appears and and they allow go go to hop back out of the trunk of the car and go go looks a little worse for wear maybe a little bit woozy after his experience yeah you know i think it, it was time to make up to it's kind of been <laughs> it's, uh, three shows in you know it was uh, i think they um they played enough tricks and games, and it was time to time to, for them to all get get along again. Time for them to bury the hatchet, I suppose. We're heading into yep. the quarterfinals. It looks like that perhaps Bigfoot is going to take out Mad Dog. We don't get to see that race, but Bigfoot's going to move on into the semis. Master of Disaster and Awesome Kong are the next pair we get to see here on this video feed, and – that wonderful run from Master of Disaster in the previous round. If he could just do that again, I think he's going to be able to get the job done. But Spanier, he has a brain fart, and he hits the hill way too hard, kind of skies over it. And that really puts him into a nasty, nasty bounce in the midrange. Yeah, got a little uncontrollable on him here and uh, just couldn't really pull it back in and, and, and get the win. But uh, the truck, like we talked about, just real powerful might be real sensitive off of that start and obviously if you're you're a pedal controlled um you know determining how much you're really going to get get in it and and uh and feather it over that hill uh, obviously the littlest things probably make the biggest difference awesome kong gonna take the win in this matchup it's worth noting the master disaster kind of bounced up onto the cars and literally just drove across the top of them and made up close to a truck length of difference just over the cars but awesome Kong probably going to take at least maybe a tire length win here in the quarterfinals to move into the semis our next oh go ahead i had him at a 4.5 there crossing the line awesome Kong. so he's he's running in that same range uh, of, of some of the other quicker uh trucks but uh you're gonna have to be a little quicker than that to uh to kind of put either crunch or, or foot on the trailer here Next matchup going to be between USA 1 and No Problem. We see Wilkie having a great run, maybe his smoothest of the weekend because he gets that nice smooth run over the hill again, able to end the Cinderella story weekend for John Moore here. It's a close race, and John Moore kind of gets a little bit more air, but USA 1 – really has got the mile an hour on the far end of the track and kind of almost goes up on his side a little bit on the big bounce. Yeah, I, I kind of felt like here he's starting to get that confidence uh, going and, you know, trying to lean on the truck a little bit more and a little bit more. But you can see as they lean on this truck, um, strange things start to happen. And uh, this thing kind of goes, you know, to the right here. And uh, he starts aiming for that tunnel and uh, really starts running out of room. But I got him at about a 4.18, and uh, so so he's going quick here. Wilkie definitely p pushing the time and the pace down further and further as he gets more time on this track. Maybe he just needed a few more reps to really get in that zone where he's up with the top guys like Bigfoot, King Crunch, where they're running that high three, low four-second zone, especially for Leaf Spring Truck. Wilkie is definitely improving throughout the weekend. He is, and it, it's got the truck. Obviously, you can see it's one of the more – should be one of the more competitive trucks 
based off of its you know its past and its history and uh you know and he is he's he's pulling down some great times here almost the um the second fastest here consistently towards the end of this bracket Whiskey Business and King Crunch, our final round two race, and it looks as though maybe Deppy ate too much of Gogo's Pizza because Stevens is going to pull an early hole shot up over the hill, and Whiskey Business is going to get kind of a slow start. Stevens is going to kind of maintain that distance over throughout the set of cars and going to take the win and moves himself into the semifinals. Yeah, great run here for for Scott, and you know he's been running well the entire time. You know, I'm sure he's he's just trying to get tense here at this point. Uh, can he get, you know, into a four flat area where he's a little more com uh, competitive uh, with uh, with the Bigfoot guys? But uh, but he's putting them on the trailer one out of, one on one here and uh, having a great weekend. It's semifinal time. Bigfoot versus Awesome Kong going to be our first matchup, and Brass. Going to put in another good fast run, but the truck in no man's land going to hook a hard right, barely keeping himself legal over the cars, kind of almost doing the a mirror image of his night one qualifying run. He takes the easy win. This time they're going to deem him legal, and it's kind of lucky because Brass almost got himself into big trouble there in the far lane. Yeah, he landed off the roller, I assume, you know, kind of attacking the roller a little more. Uh, than usual, the thing kind of settles a little to the right, and uh, you know that puts his trajectory there uh, off that off of that stack. And like you said, just staying legal enough uh, for them to uh, move him on here. But it was a heck of a run, uh, you know, getting a little time here on him. He's he's in the three eight range again, and you know that's kind of where he's been the entire time, unless he really has to push it. So uh, another good run. Good thing it was legal and awesome. Just kind of ran what he could do, uh, but that was that was enough. He was done for the night. Our other semifinal matchup going to feature two of the fastest runners of the night, King Crunch and USA One, and we're going to see who can kind of stay smoother throughout this second semifinal matchup. This is going to be what appears to be, uh, on the eye test anyway, a little bit slower run for King Crunch because he kind of bounces into that face of the ramp with a, with a bad bounce in no man's land. Wilkie going to come in hard at the finish. He got a little bit of a slower start this time, and King Crunch able to hold on for the victory, but Wilkie kind of passes him up in the shutdown area and has to duck for that exit once again. Yeah, I kind of feel like USA One didn't get the uh, the landing quite right and is shifting or whatever happens there. Uh, didn't get it quite as as good as he did the run before, and then kind of overdrove the back side of the track, just trying to make it up. And like you said, uh, Scott just kind of buried those front tires in the first ramp on his bounce and uh, allowed the you know made the truck shoot straight up, and uh, definitely not their best run for either one of them. But Scott definitely with the better the better of the two. Scott with a little better bounce. Again, a, a rough ride, but able to hold on for the win. Wilkie, the big 572 engine, not quite able to get it done despite all of the speed and power behind that machine. Now, I believe in speed. Power. Power and speed yes. solves many things. Yes. Yeah, you know, just not quite enough track left there. And, um, you know, he kind of gets off to the right side and then just aims right for the tunnel and has a hard time stopping that thing over and over again. <laughs> well, I guess we'll go. Uh, let's see here. We've got I'm um, paired down to two now. And before we get to our finals, we've got another skit here with Gogo the Gorilla doing more of our Salt Lake City, how do they walk? And boy, Gogo looks awfully woozy, maybe even a little bit inebriated as he goes down hard on the Salt Palace floor. And Scott Douglas not happy about it. No, he, he felt that was unfair, and he really wants Gogo to kind of get up and uh, make up to the crowd here. <laughs> now, we go into here. This is now our triple header third show of the weekend it's time for the monster smash finals third 
time these guys have matched up throughout the weekend, Jason, Bigfoot and King Crunch. And like the Aerosmith song goes, it's the same old story. It's the same old song and dance. Brass punches in another picture, perfect run. Stevens pushes it hard, but just comes up that little bit short again, maybe a truck length on a bad bounce into the ramp. Bigfoot, Andy Brass going three for three in Salt Lake City. Yeah, and you can see why uh, there was a lot of frustration from the rest of the teams after this and, you know, the, the three in a row. And I, I got them here at a 3.7 uh, on this uh, run, you know, which would probably be, you know, one of his fastest of the night. And I, I thought I think he kind of overdrove that hill just a touch. But uh, obviously with this truck, you could afford to to do that. That was the idea behind the suspension is, um, you know, it seems like he kind of popped it up. He lets it kind of land on all fours in between and then just jumps on it and uh, kind of flies it to the finish. He really does. It's a little bit of a mistake, as you said, but the truck is able to kind of accommodate that. And that's what makes the combination so good with Andy and Bigfoot 8. Andy's just rock solid behind the wheel. But if he does have that slight, you know, 10th or 2 miscue, the truck's there to kind of help bail him out of it, and he's going to end up taking the win. The third one in a row here on the tour, we get the winner's interview from Scott Douglas for Andy Brass and Bigfoot. We finish the show out with a laser light show that they are, I guess, projecting onto the roof of the Salt Palace. That was something that TNT did a lot back in those days where they were kind of advertised it as part of the show. Um, we see the a monster truck laser kind of crushing and jumping over the TNT logo, which is pretty cool. I remember them doing these laser light shows when I was in elementary school. Um, they were always pretty cool. Uh, some of the kids that made them sick, maybe that's why they don't do it so much anymore. But um, I thought it was a pretty cool way to finish out a monster truck show with this kind of laser light setup. Yeah, what it reminds me of now is when uh, they're posting online the uh, the Christmas lights of uh, where they had that touring uh, Bigfoot 5 Christmas light show going around. And mm. that's what this kind of reminds me of. Uh, the, uh, the I don't know what these things are, but these little neon lights or whatever they are. So that's going to kind of wrap up the competition side of this show. We've done three shows here in Salt Lake City. And the story is... Again, the domination of Bigfoot 8 here, taking three clean sweeps on the weekend. Now, we've got the little bobble in, in night number one qualifying, but if you take out that penalty, Brass is still the fastest truck by a good margin. And you have to wonder if this is where really the, the, the frustration's building for these owners, especially Scott Stevens, because we go here, Stevens loses three times to Bigfoot 8, and, and Scott, the previous year, had the technological Marvel truck with all the best parts and pieces and kind of took part of the year off and, and came in late and was able to compete and take some wins. They then go to Albuquerque a week or two later, and it's kind of the same thing again where King Crunch gets stomped by Bigfoot. So you have to feel that this is where a lot of this animosity between the two teams is kind of building throughout the weekends. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really kind of interesting that, <clears throat> you know, Scott's being affected by this um, in the racing standings, and he's getting second, and he's not happy with that. Uh, he's, you know, he's he's running well for himself, but he's not happy. He doesn't feel that Bigfoot 8 should be out there racing uh, with the other trucks, and uh, he's kind of, um, you know, according to the, the, the telecast anyway, he's been kind of the, the ringleader for getting uh, the guys together to... Uh, kind of stand against um, the the new truck here and and uh, but he is running well himself. He's getting a lot of good second place finishes. He's making changes to the truck, as he alludes to during the Albuquerque show, and he's not giving up hope. But he, I think, but he's also uh, trying to slow um, Bigfoot back down again. He's he's trying to ramp it up here with everybody uh, to kind of get them to make a decision. Uh, to kind of level the playing field here. So uh, maybe is what I'm assuming is would be good for him. Well, protect number one if you can, I guess. So they're, they're going to campaign to get the truck banned here. And I guess they're successful. By the time we get to Dallas, we see no Bigfoot 8. And, and Bigfoot 4 is kind of slotted in as a fill-in until they're able to figure things out later in the season. So, Jason, 
we we do the thing here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. We've got a threefer this week, three shows in one shot. Now, none of them were televised, so we don't have to necessarily take TV production into account for our show ratings. But overall on the weekend, how do you rate this weekend in Salt Lake City from a, a production and performance perspective? It's got to be an, uh, an eight plus for me. Uh, you know, if like we talked about when we started things out, I would, man, I wish I could buy a ticket to go back and watch this show and this event. And it just would, you know, I think about things of like being there, having the photos from an event like this or video like Tomster does and those memories. Um, but, you know, the competition was there. Of course, I'm sure you could, uh, you know, take it a, a step further if you had Equalizer, Carolina Crusher, and Gravedigger. Uh, but like you said, what is it, a 15 truck lineup? I mean, that's unheard yeah. of uh today or uh, you know maybe even in those days it was very rare to have just so many trucks and honestly that's what i liked i i liked as a spectator and as a fan on tv i loved when they had a real full bracket and a ton of variety as well. We've got a lot of identities here. Some of them we didn't get to see much on the TNT circuit. I agree with you wholly. I give this an 8 out of 10. We've got, again, the variety of the lineup. We've got a lot of good competitors. And we've got a few guys that kind of broke through a little bit. John Moore really having a great weekend of performance and no problem. We had an absolutely at least one killer run by Doug Spanier, Master Disaster. And Pablo Cruz and Tough Enough, again, I'm calling him the breakout star of the weekend because he really was smooth and was able to go a number of rounds throughout the weekend and, and make it into the semifinals. So a really, really good event. And, um, you know, Jason, I appreciate you coming in and helping fill in my former co-host role here on the show this week. Uh, is there anything that you want to plug or head into the, the week off here? You know, not really. I just appreciate people listening to this and keeping, um, I guess, my favorite era of monster trucks going, which is this uh, late 80s, early 90s. That's the, the my uh, time period where I was the biggest fan um, <clears throat> and uh, really going through all this stuff. And I just really wish we had more of it. Uh, you know, you and I always talk about how, uh, you know, there's there's got to be more footage. There's got to be more photos of these shows we haven't seen and I guess that's my big uh, plug is if anybody's listening and they have any photos or video of anything from that uh, that time period, get it out there, right? For sure. If you if you have a way to get it up online to the Facebook groups or YouTube, you know, share it with us. We all want to see it. Anything that you may have. If you've got old VHS that you, you don't have a way to, to do anything with, get a hold of me, Matt Stoltz, on Facebook. And I'll, I'll find a way to get it transferred for you, and we'll get you a digital copy of it back. So we want to make sure we capture all the history of this great industry. I want to remind everybody that if you're able to, please go out and donate blood. We're in a severe, severe shortage right now with the pandemic going on. On. And uh, if you can get to an American Red Cross or Vitalant location, uh, donate blood, donate platelets. Um, if it wasn't for folks doing that, I certainly would not be alive right now with the things I've gone through the last few years. So thank you to everybody that's donated. I hope to be able to do it myself here as soon as I get doctor clearance. And um, we want to thank you for that. Next week here on the show, we're going to be covering Salzmere, Florida, Monster Trucks 2000 at Mesa Park. It's going to be a show you don't want to miss. Thank you for tuning in this week, the Retro Monster Truck Review. We'll see who's uh, along on the ride with us here next week, and we're going to go ahead and shut the show down. Thank you for everybody watching. We'll see you. All those flavors, and Scott Stevens decided to be salty. <laughs>